TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, D. Wood, and with me now is the least useful person on the planet because he has spent decades of his life exposing jihad. And as we all know, jihad is just going to the gym. That's what, uh, who was that? Was that, was that CARE? Was that the Why Islam campaign? What was that? Yes, that was CARE's My Jihad campaign. <laughs> my going... Jihad is not forgetting my keys or, you know, <laughs> dropping off the kids at school on time. You yeah. know something? That is still with us. As a matter of fact, a little news item to start us off tonight, David, is that the Sundance Film Festival, Robert Redford's Film Festival, featured, oddly enough, a documentary called Jihad Rehab about a so-called de-radicalization program in Saudi Arabia. And so far, two Sundance officials have resigned from their positions, and the film is under fire for Islamophobia because it uses the word jihad, which everybody knows is only an interior spiritual struggle and has nothing whatsoever to do with terrorism. Yeah, shame on them. Yep. What the heck? Yeah, we need to boycott that. Everyone knows <laughs> it's, it's just, you know struggling to go to the dentist when you're supposed to it's a struggle yeah, it is it is wait by the way were you were you joking when you when you called it robert redford's uh isn't it robert redford's film festival i, I don't know is it if 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 so that's hilarious because i mean is that he was the sundance kid and butch cassidy and the sundance yeah, I, kid I, I, I i'm pretty sure it's his i thought he founded it and called it that because of the sundance because, oh, okay no i had no idea i'd never i'd never i had no idea what the uh i knew it was but, a film festival if there's a film that's been made after 1951, I don't really care. So I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that that's hilarious. If he, if he did that and then named it after uh, the yeah, Sundance kid, I, that's awesome. I do believe that is the case, sir. Well, it's, it's the, the, but the, let's not forget what really matters. They crack down on people who, you know, said that jihad is something other <clears throat> than going to the gym. Uh, it's the thing of beauty, David, and everybody knows that. And so it was a terrible co uh, commission of Islamophobia for these uh, film producers to call their film Jihad when it has to do with Al-Qaeda terrorists. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, the Al-Qaeda terrorists will be the first to tell you that they are twisting and hijacking the peaceful religion of Islam and actually know little to nothing about it. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're going to see plenty of, of that here <clears throat> during this hour when Robert tries to say that there's some sort of jihad attacks going on and i repeat it, i repeatedly have to correct him and probably ban him <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna i might have to i might have to mute you a bunch of times for saying that jihad is some has something to do with violently subjugating unbelievers in the name of allah or something i'm an incorrigible recidivist david it's it's you are terrible. Some, some people never learn. Some people just never learn. They just, you know. Right. Anyway. Some men you just can't reach. All right. Let's talk about one of the first. Oh, but by, by the way, everyone, uh, uh, we haven't uh, done one of these shows in several weeks. I got COVID at the end of December. Did not know that it was COVID. Just thought it was uh, a cold. It felt like it felt exactly like a like a cold. And then. Uh, after several days, so into January, my wife got tested. Turned out it was COVID. And then so I got tested and turns out it was COVID. And then got over the COVID to where I supposedly didn't have COVID, but I had just an, an ongoing cough. So throughout throughout the entire month of January, um, I did get a couple of videos out and so on, but, but, but uh, I didn't want to record anything long because uh, I would go into... Uh, I, I just kept having to cough, and so it's hard to hard to do anything. So anyway, that's why we haven't uh, we haven't been going live. Um, so that's why we haven't been live. But what that means is, Robert, there have been a lot. Uh, I'm not sure what to call them because we can't call them jihad attacks. We'll be banned from Sundance. Um, yeah. <laughs> a lot of hijacking of the religion of peace. A lot of going. misunderstanding. A lot of misunderstanding of Islam events. Let's exactly. Just, let's call it that. Uh, now, Robert, the the the, uh, the main one lots of people will be thinking of that we missed here because we weren't live would be the attack 
uh, the hostage situation in Texas, which I was less than 30 minutes from while it was happening. I was debating. I mean, this is an amazing situation. I was debating a Muslim, a Muslim apologist, Muslim debater, Kenny Bomer, on whether Muhammad's relationship with Aisha, his marriage to Aisha, was immoral. This guy that I'm on stage with is repeatedly calling me an Islamophobe as I have to argue that having sex with a prepubescent girl is bad. And less than 30 minutes away, there's a jihadi, excuse me, a misunderstander of Islam with a bunch of Jewish hostages at a synagogue demanding the release of Lady Al-Qaeda. That was yes. going on. All right. So what happened there? Because uh, as soon as it happened, they were saying that it that it, it, it wasn't a uh, it had nothing to do with anti-Semitism or something like that. Go, go ahead and fill us in. The FBI said, yeah, the FBI initially said that it was not targeting the Jewish community, which was flatly false, because what happened was Malik Faisal uh, Akram, Malik Faisal Akram, who lived in Britain, got a visa, came to the United States, which is questionable to start with because he had a lengthy criminal record, which should have disqualified him from being able to enter the United States. And that has not yet been explained, if it will ever be explained. But anyway, he got in, he came over and went to Texas, to Colleyville, right outside Dallas, I believe. And he, <coughs> excuse me, he went into a synagogue, took hostages, and was railing all this time against the Jews. The rabbi, who was one of the hostages, the rabbi of this synagogue, said that he was there because he believed that the Jews control the world. And so he thought that if he went to a synagogue and took hostages, he could the, the rabbi could get on the phone to the chief rabbi and get Afia Siddiqui, Lady Al Qaeda, freed. Wow. I see I didn't I didn't know any of that, but I mean it makes sense if you're like if you basically the same things that we've seen for years uh, especially coming out of you know Palestinian TV and stuff that the the Jews are are I mean I mean they're controlling animals they're controlling snakes and uh, they're they're putting things in everyone's drinks to control the world and so on so we've seen that over and over again so I guess it's not a leap to say hey uh, take some hostages and they could just get on the phone and have have a bunch of people released so yeah he called he had the rabbi call another rabbi in New York in order to demand the freeing of Afia Siddiqui. And uh, it's clear that, that you're absolutely right. This comes out of, in the first place, the Quran's anti-Semitism. Whoa, 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 whoa. What did you, what did, uh, come on. The Quran's anti-Semitism? <laughs> the Quran's misunderstanding of Islam. Let, 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 let's see, Robert, just try and defend that. Come on. The Quran's teaching that the Jews are the worst enemies of the Muslims in chapter five, verse 82 and that they are always scheming against the Muslims, trying to impede their plans. And consequently, you mix this as the Palestinian media and so many other, <coughs> excuse me, media outlets in the Islamic world do, you mix this with these conspiracy theories about Jews controlling the media, controlling the political systems of the various countries, then this fellow is going to think, these are the people responsible for the jailing of Afi Siddiqui, and these are the people who are powerful enough to get her free. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where you start with, I mean, as long as you have a delusional belief, then everything else falls into place after that, and and some and your your strategy and your theory and your plot and your plan can all make perfect sense uh, based on that insane delusion and it so all stems straight from uh what we would call the misunderstanding of uh islam that is taught in the quran darn misunderstandings of islam that are taught in the quran they are <laughs> they, they are a problem david it's a it's a terrible thing and then to compound <laughs> the situation uh an imam in a friday sermon in washington dc abdul ali musa who has said that he would like to see the united states become an Islamic state by 2050. Who wouldn't? said that the uh, whole hostage situation in Texas was set up by... That, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. 
Eskimos. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it was all set up by Eskimos, uh, who he called Zionists for some reason, hmm. in order to give Muslims a bad name. He said, just think, the other day some fellow that they call a Muslim had something go down in Texas. Now, anyone who's been there more than two or three years has to know that this is stuff arranged by the Zionists. Why? To give us a bad name. When you look at the World Trade Center, when you look at all those things that have happened here in America, you have to look at the Zionists. Who had the ability to do it? The Muslims didn't have the ability to do no World Trade Center. They couldn't have pulled anything like that off. This is Imam Abdullah Musa, director of Masjid al-Islam in Washington, D.C. And if you, you if you go back to what he said, uh, something I think you said something went down in Texas that that does that is reminiscent of Ilhan Omar. Uh, some people on 9-11 did something. <laughs> yep. Wow. These things are very vague. Yes. Yeah, people keep doing stuff for you. you, you in fact, uh, for, for anyone who doesn't have it, uh, there's a link in the description box to Robert's uh, Robert's book. He has a ton of books, but uh, if you want the history of jihad, he has literally written the book on the history of jihad. It'll take you from the time of Muhammad right down to our time. But uh, it's weird how some people keep doing something for 14 centuries straight in the name of some god and some other dude. Anyway. All it right. is very strange. It is. But in any case, uh, the, the Imam Abdul Alim Musa suggested that M Malik Faisal Akram was not even a Muslim, but he was actually on the radar of the British intelligence services for many years. He was referred to a counterterror program. He was uh, seen railing against the Jews, saying that he wanted to kill Jews. He was investigated by MI5, and they decided that he posed no credible threat. Hmm. That's good to know. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, you see, everything's all right now. Nobody was killed aside from him in Texas. But actually, he said one other thing he said while he was there was that he wanted to serve as a model for other Muslims to attack other synagogues in the United States. Uh, so, and and, and this, this, this would go back to, I mean, a similar idea. If you really think, hey, these guys can just get get on the phone and call up and, and get some terrorist release, get some terrorist release, then, I mean, it's it seems like a brilliant, it seems like a brilliant plan. But uh, gosh, yeah. this stuff is nuts. And I mean, it's the idea that he's encouraging other people. And that is the, uh, that's the really creepy thing. Because once someone, like, once someone hatches a plan and comes up with a way of doing things you get all these other people who are who are inspired by it. it's, like, it's like as soon as someone started you know ramming cars into crowds of people all of a sudden there was like a wave of them like everyone everyone wanted to jump into a truck and, and run and uh, drive into a crowd and al-qaeda has named him a martyr saying that there is no greater enemy that the muslims have than the jews which of course comes from the quran once again chapter 5 verse 82 and so it is likely that this kind of talk is going to encourage people, as is the fact that the Blackburn Muslim community, uh, this fellow was from Blackburn, Lancashire in, in England, uh, he, uh, they, they prayed at the uh, news that he had done this, that he would attain the highest ranks of paradise. Uh, this was on Facebook. Later on, they took it down when they started to get a lot of uh, flack about it. But I wonder why no doubt they were enthusiastic about his actions initially i wonder why you would think that that has something to do with uh paradise i mean well, if, i mean if, well, if muhammad had said if muhammad had said you know that jihad or fighting in jihad or fighting the unbelievers was some sort of great deed then maybe but it's, yeah and if the quran had said paradise is guaranteed to those who kill and are killed for allah Something like that might encourage people to do something like this. Yeah, fortunately, we don't have any of that, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing like that <laughs> anywhere in. It's definitely not over and over and over again in the Muslim sources. Let's just uh, let's just put it that way. Indeed. All right. So I'm guessing that has to. I mean, we occasionally in in various ideologies, you occasionally have some just really weird dude. 
uh, come out of nowhere. Like you had in New Zealand, you had that guy who's a self-proclaimed, what, what do you call himself? An eco-fascist or something like that? Something, yeah, in his little manifesto, it said he's something like he, an eco-fascist or something like that. And then you had... So you had Anders Breivik, and he eventually he eventually declared that he's an Odinist, and uh, uh, I saw him doing a doing a Nazi salute and stuff like that. But uh, so you have the, you have some some weirdos come out of weird ideologies here and there, but they're they're rare. So obviously, if we got you know this guy down in Texas and another guy over here. Obviously, you've reached your quota of total wackos who have no clue what they're talking about, and they're just crazy. It has nothing to do with their ideology. So we've reached their quota, so there's no more, right? Well, as a matter of fact, David, there's a news item out of Chicago. A gentleman named Shahid Hussein, who had a very interesting fashion sense. He, if you see the mugshot of him, he's got a little mustache right here but it's trimmed. It's, it's, it doesn't go all the way across, just right in the center. Huh. I don't know where he got that idea. No. But uh, he was arrested for uh, recently painting the famous Nazi symbol on the wall of a synagogue and on the grounds of a Jewish high school in Chicago. This is uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, right after the Texas synagogue incident. He's also accused of shattering a glass door <coughs> and cracking another at a synagogue a few blocks away. And he was seen re, uh, at yet another synagogue kicking in inside <coughs> and railing about the Jews. Huh. So you got to wonder, David, there's quite a lot of uh, anti-Semitism for some reason. When Muslims misunderstand Islam, they often do it in a violently anti-Semitic manner. It just sucks that the true religion <clears throat> the true religion whose God brags throughout the Quran over and over again like a beating drum about how clear, how crystal clear his commands are, keeps producing so many people who misunderstand it in exactly the same way. It's, I'm, I don't know. It is, it's extraordinary. A, a, an error in communication of catastrophic proportions mm -hmm. from the greatest communicator the possible. Clear the clearest yeah. communicator possible. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then we go to Wisconsin, to Wausau, Wisconsin. Noticing a lot of places in America here. Yeah, I, I, I got quite a lot of American jihad. This huh. uh, American this, jihad. Uh, and this is Matula Matie, who was an Afghan refugee, very charming fellow, and very mediagenic. He became a the subject of several, not one, but several features on WSAW there in Wausau, Wisconsin, about his plight in Afghanistan and his new life in America and uh, how grateful he is to be here. He said, this is a new culture, a new life, but I'm feeling... I, I, I like him already. I like him already. Sounds like a really good guy. He said, I moved from small America because that's where he was from, Lashkar Ga in Afghanistan, which is called Little America. And he moved from little America to large America. He said about the people in Wausau, I like these people. It's a very nice and beautiful city. I cannot imagine the night when I arrived first to the Wausau and the mayor, Ms. Katie, and all the church ladies and gentlemen came for my welcoming. I told to my wife that I'm feeling like this was me and yours wedding night. Now, wow, uh, wow, wow. Wait, no, I, this is just a totally heartwarming story i might have to do a video about this heartwarming story about uh someone who comes from afghanistan really really tough over there and then is greeted by the mayor and all these church ladies and it's just beautiful beautiful coming to america story wow it is and then unfortunately david wausau mayor katie rosenberg issued a statement saying i was stunned and heartbroken to hear that a woman who was working to assist Wausau's new refugee arrivals in their resettlement reported that she was sexually assaulted by one of the refugees, none other than, none other than Mattia La Mattie. And she said, Katie went on to say, this doesn't define all Afghan refugees. We know that not all re Afghan refugees will commit sexual assault. That's true. But there was another, David, hmm. in connection with this, 
Uh, and this one was in Virginia. And an Afghan named Mohammed Tariq, another refugee who was arrested at Quantico Marine Base in Virginia because he was seen sexually assaulting a three-year-old girl. And he explained that this was something that was perfectly acceptable in his culture. And I would not be surprised if Matilda Matie in Wausau, Wisconsin, also thought that what he was doing was perfectly acceptable because, of course, a woman who's not covered, who's not veiled, chapter 33, verse 59 of the Quran says that you veil in order to not be molested. Mm -hmm. So if you are not veiled, you are inviting the molestation. And it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, think Matilda Matie and Muhammad Tariq they really they ought to be freed because they were just following their own culture and religion to act as if that our laws supersede that is incredibly Islamophobic and ethnocentric. And um, yeah, I see someone posting uh, Surah 65, verse four, which, as, as you know, Robert, according to uh, one of the most famous Muslim uh, da'is on the planet, Muhammad Hijab, if you just go with what the Quran says there, you would assume that you can have sex with five-year-olds. So I don't right. see why that would be any different for, you know, for a three-year-old. If he says that the Quran gives you an idea that you could have sex with a five-year-old, uh, it seems that the same would apply to a three-year-old, according to Muhammad Hijab. Now, just to be clear, Muhammad Hijab does not believe that it's okay to have sex with five-year-olds he believes you have to go to the hadith where you know you find out that you know you have to wait till the ripe old age of nine or something like that or you know at least till the the little girls are ready but maybe maybe unfortunately these uh these afghanis just you know they weren't that familiar with the hadith and so they weren't aware of these passages and so they just went with the quran and so uh it doesn't matter how young she is according to the quran but uh you also can take you know sex captives from the enemies of of islam and so on and so needless to say you get all sorts of horrible horrible ideas and, and robert it's it seemed to me it seemed to me seems to me over over uh many years of think things like this happening you know we were people are generally now f familiar with the grooming gang situation in the uk but uh you and i had read stories like that similar stories um, I've seen them from Australia. I'd seen them from Scandinavia. The, those stories were, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't on the same scale. Uh, it wasn't as, it wasn't as prominent as it was in the UK. But um, you have all of these situations with immigrants coming and just thinking it's perfectly acceptable to rape, to groom, rape, gang rape, pimp out um, these non-Muslim girls. And it, it, it seems that, in in places like Afghanistan, where you know you have death penalties for all kinds of things, like you know someone someone could just kill you if you get out of line looking at you know his sister wrong or something like that, or you know she'll get killed too. But it seems like they a lot of people just never develop any sort of internal moral compass about right and wrong because the threat is always external right the threat is always external you get out of line we will we will kill you and so you have to follow the uh the the rules that are imposed upon you and then you get somewhere and you no longer have to worry about being killed for doing the wrong thing and they just seem to lose their minds wait now i can just go out and rape and and do whatever i want and the yeah no uh, virtue is ever inculcated it's never said these things shouldn't be done because they are harmful to you and to the person that you're doing them to. And thus, you're better off if you do not do them. This kind of thing is never taught. It's just if you do this, we'll cut off your hand or stone you to death or whatever. And, and that's why there was, uh, you remember uh, in Egypt, uh, Lara Logan, is that her name? Lara Logan? Lara Logan, yes. Yeah, she just, she just walked around. She just walked around and a mob of men jumped on her. I mean, they, they pounced and, and that, that happened over and over and over again during, you know, those, those Egyptian protests and so on. But I mean, I mean, think about that. I mean, if, 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 if I go to a football game or something like this and some, someone jumps on a girl, uh, it's not going to be, Oh, let's all jump on her. And yet there it is. Oh, a girl showed up. Hey, let's all molest her at the same time. And so well, it's like, so she's obviously wants this. 
Yeah, and very, uh, very, uh, it's, it's weird, man. The misunderstandings abound. All right, it what is. else we got? Hey, I got a big misunderstanding story for you out of Colorado. Co still in the U.S. Oh, guys, yeah. I, guys, keep in mind, we are in the U.S. <laughs> Aurora, Colorado. A 19-year-old man was arrested, this was last Sunday, for setting fire to his house. Mohammed Ibrahim Afia was setting fire actually to his sister's dolls on a lit stove because a lot whoa, 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 whoa. See, right now, I, I could, some crazy guy burned down a house. There's no way this could at all be connected to anything Allah or Muhammad have ever said, right? Crazy person burns down a house. You want to say it's got something to do with Islam. All right, finish right now, but we already know this is totally pointless. Well, I'll tell you, David, Muhammad Afia himself said that everything he did, he did because Allah told him to do. Now, you might think, Okay, so this guy is crazy. But what Allah told him to do was to burn the idols mm. in the house. And there is a hadith, a hadith from uh, Sunan an Nasai that says Allah, Ali came to some people of Azut who worshipped idols and burned them. Mm -hmm. So it's really not out of the realm of possibility that this guy thought that he needed to burn these dolls because they were idols. I mean, that's absurd, but that's what he thought. And that the best way to get rid of the idols would be to burn them because this was about imitating Muhammad. And, and by the way, everyone, uh, because we understand there there can be uh, people who aren't familiar with discussions uh, we've had in the past or articles or videos and so on. Uh, dolls are not allowed in Islam after you've reached the age of puberty, after you've reached the age of moral accountability. And uh, that's actually how we know that Aisha had not reached puberty when Muhammad started having sex with her. In fact, she ha she didn't reach puberty until several years after he started having sex with her. Um, because it sa specifically says that when she came, when she was brought to his house in order to consummate the marriage, she said, my, and my dolls were with me. And uh, the Muslim sources say that she had dolls, she kept dolls in her house and so on. That was only allowed, that was only allowed before you've reached the age of moral accountability. Once you've reached puberty, then dolls had to be destroyed. And so... So makes, Muhammad Afiya took care of it at his took house. Took care of it, took care of those dolls. He set a fire in the house itself. Uh, and, uh, well, he's charged with all kinds of arson charges and so on. We'll see how that works out. Okay, now let's go to Kansas. What? <laughs> Is this like, like every state in the world? <laughs> <laughs> well, David, it has been three weeks. <laughs> wow. Overbook, Kansas. A school teacher named Allison Fluke Ekren converted to Islam, started to call herself Um Muhammad al Amriki, that is the mother of Muhammad the American. Mm hmm. She has been arrested, charged with providing and conspiring to provide material support to ISIS. She was plotting jihad massacres in the United States on college campuses and shopping malls. She said that the believers should dress like infidels and drop off a backpack with explosives in a, on a college <clears throat> campus. The shopping mall plot was, a lot, was uh, very similar, although she wanted to park a vehicle full of explosives in the basement or the parking garage of the structure and then detonate them from a safe distance. Uh, she was also raising a child whose parents had participated in a suicide bombing. One of her friends said that on a scale of radicalization from one to 10, she was an 11. Wow. Hudson Fluke Ekren of Overbook, Kansas, a mild mannered school teacher who went jihad. Uh, you know, you know, Robert, here's what I always find most interesting. So <clears throat> Ali Dawa recently had. Uh, uh, yes, I saw. Yeah. I'm proud of that. Uh, <laughs> Ali Dawa had a discussion with the apostate prophet and Ali Dawa. I'm, I'm saying this because you and I have experienced this a lot over the years, but Ali Dawa was accusing 
the apostate prophet and other Islamophobes for being the cause of violence against Muslims. And Ali Dawah was saying, you know, if my wife go down the street and someone pull off her hijab, yeah, then that's because of you. You know, he's, 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 he's acting like it's because of the apostate prophet, even though the apostate prophet has never supported that. Um, he's never supported violence or attacks on Muslims. You haven't. I haven't. And yet we're blamed for it repeatedly, uh, even though we condemn attack, you know, just attacks on random Muslims. Yeah, if you have to deal with Al Qaeda or something like that, that's one thing. But you know, attacks on random Muslims, we are against oppression. We are against uh, targeting groups like that. And yet we're somehow responsible for it. And yet, when you have over and over and over again just random converts to Islam, they all, I mean, they, over and over again, they 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 keep getting the idea that they need to go on a killing spree. And we say, could this possibly have something to do with <clears throat> the commands in Islam's most trusted sources to violently subjugate the world? Could this have anything to do with Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah? Could it have anything to do with Muhammad's uh, claim that he had uh, been sent to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah and that he's the messenger of Allah. Could this have anything to do with Muhammad saying that he's been made victorious with terror? Could any of this be connected? And it's no. So th this is just the amazing thing I see over and over again. We have never supported these sort of random violent attacks against random Muslims who aren't who aren't doing anything, who aren't breaking any laws, never supported that. And yet we're somehow responsible for attacks against them. And yet you have the commands of the Quran and the Hadith and in the Sirah and 14 centuries of Muslim scholars and Muslim leaders around the world today who are calling for jihad. And we say, is there any connection between that and people actually carrying out the tax? No, and you're a bigot for suggesting that there's there's a connection. There's just a, it's it's an it's an amazing situation. Well, you know, David, there's so many converts to Islam who have turned to jihad, turned to terrorism. I have a whole category converts to Islam. People can find it at Jihad Watch. There's a drop down box for categories on the right sidebar, and uh, <clears throat> you can see story after story after story going back years of people all around the world who converted to Islam and then they get the idea that their new religion commands them to wage war against unbelievers and to do violence. Now this is extraordinary and there is not a single intelligence agency anywhere in the world that shows any interest in this phenomenon even though it can, keeps recurring. And yet it seems to me that it's extremely curious if what our authorities tell us all over the world about Islam is true. If Islam is a religion of peace and it has nothing to do with terrorism and it teaches tolerance and love and so on, then why is it that so many converts, a steady stream of converts, regularly somehow get the idea that it enjoins violence? How did they get this idea? Because they're coming new. They're a tabula rasa. They're coming new to the texts and they don't have any preconceptions. They just want to serve Allah because this is their new religion. How do so many converts get the idea that Islam mandates violence? Why are there so very many other people like Allison Fluke Ekron? And this has never been answered. Nobody even cares to ask. Yeah, see, I, I grant that you can just you can just have a crazy person or a person who is, you know, emotionally disturbed and it it, it might not matter what that person is or becomes that you could have a random person from any any ideology who just decides to go on a on a violent killing spree but uh with all of the converts to islam who immediately misunderstand their religion and decide that what their god wants them to do is to go on a killing spree <clears throat> If it, was, if it had no connection to the ideology, if it had no connection to the religion, then you would expect to see the exact same proportion among adherents of, of any ideology, right? If it's, just, if it's just, hey, you know, here's the number of people who convert and here's a, the percentage who decide to go on a killing spree. If it has nothing to do with the ideology, that, that same percentage should hold for any ideology. Anyone who converts to something should... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a matter of uh, distribution. There are crazy people all over the world. If this is just people going crazy, then an equal amount number of people who convert to Christianity 
convert to Hinduism, Buddhism, whatever, are going to be crazy in this way. And yet it's only converts to Islam. All right. That's all for the United States, but I got plenty from around the world, David. Oh, wait, gosh. We've only dealt with one country? <laughs> <laughs> we, only got, we only got like 25 minutes left. <laughs> You've only gone through one country. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Took us half an hour to get through just one country. Wow. Okay. Well, it has been three weeks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Haytham Tamim, who is the founder and main teacher of the Utruj Foundation, which is an Islamic organization in Britain, is uh, under fire because he wrote an article called Can a Man Beat His Wife in Islam? And he has a section called When It Is Permissible, mm -hmm. in which he explains that the right to beat wives is part of a process if a wife is undermining her husband's authority and when she is troublesome or mm -hmm. causing issues. This, of course, is based on the Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, which says that you should beat women from whom you fear disobedience. But I found it kind of interesting that uh, the National Secular Society is where I got this article, and they're all upset about it, and all these other people in Britain are upset about it, as if this fellow is unusual. And yet, I think, what, did you expect him to ignore the Quran? Do you think he's the only one who teaches what the Quran says about beating a disobedient woman? And, of course, this is just part of the denial about the nature of what they're dealing with that we find all over the West. Yeah, and, I mean, you have mainstream, popular Muslim apologists right now defending wife beating. So, Daniel Hakikachu, very yeah. popular Muslim, hero to many. Uh, and he actually goes into great detail to defend wife beating in islam and his his argument goes along these lines hey we all agree that people need to be punished in certain situations and you would even agree i mean people would generally agree if a, if a woman does something really really bad breaks the law or something like this that the state would have the authority to punish her so why wouldn't her husband have the authority to punish her by beating her and really, this is Hakikachu, not D. Wood. Uh, wouldn't it be better for her husband to punish her when her husband loves her dearly? Wouldn't that be better than the state punishing her and the state doesn't doesn't love her dearly? And therefore, um, therefore, it's it's important for men to have the right to beat their wives into submission. So, so this isn't just, and this is what I find amazing, right? It, we're, we're we're repeatedly told whenever <laughs> whenever these you know hey islam says that you kill apostates islam says that you can beat your wife into submission and it really seems to be a popular perspective among non-muslims that it's just like some fringe minority who might believe these things and yeah maybe in their texts but who cares because most people don't believe that and yet people you know ali dawa one of the most popular dais on the planet. I mean, he openly says, "Hey, once we get control, we're going to come. We're going to come kill you, apostates." He openly says that, and he's extremely popular for it. Daniel Hakikachu defends uh, not just killing apostates but beating women. He's extremely popular, and you know, whenever whenever they do statistics, you find like what ninety percent or something like that, or people in Egypt say, "Yeah, you should kill apostates," and it's just it, it, somehow it's still built into people's thinking. Tiny, tiny tiny fraction of people why because i've i have several muslim friends and they've never said that therefore let me just pretend that that applies to the entire population of the world our propaganda <clears throat> but uh you know the wives are not being accused of criminal acts so that's the problem with hakikachu's ar argument but yeah i suppose that's for another day uh france a muslim holding a quran and screaming allahu akbar injured three people with a wrench that he was holding as well. So he had a wrench and a Quran, and he went around swinging the wrench at people, injuring three. Also in France, a Muslim entered a church during a funeral, screamed Allahu Akbar, and then got out a marker and put a Nazi symbol on the wall. France. What, 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 hang on, what is up with all the Nazi symbols? Like, <clears throat> Well, you know, there's a lot of affinity between the Nazis and the... Muslims who believe in the anti-Semitic teachings of the Quran, 
because they both hate Jews. Now, now, Robert, I, I have to step in here. If that were the case, I would have expected Adolf Hitler to work with some, some, you know, some, 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 some Muslims and to yeah, like you know. the Mufti of Jerusalem, for example. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. <laughs> Raise up a SS division in Bosnia of Muslims. That's what you'd expect. Yeah. And what, 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 what wasn't he the guy? So why did we have to get the Christian religion? <laughs> Yeah, Hitler remember that? that? Yeah, Hitler. Why did we have to get the Christian religion? Why not the Muslim religion? Well, that's right. It would have been more suited to the German martial temperament. Yeah, and he was he was actually he was uh he was actually still a racist. So he still he was still a, a racist against Arab he, he Arabs. He he viewed them as inferior. So he believed they had the right religion, but yeah. that the people just couldn't carry it out properly, and that if that religion had been combined with what what he viewed as these superior qualities of the, his master race that you would just you would you would conquer the world. Six That's stuff. what he said. Six stuff. Another one out of France. Another Muslim migrant with a long knife and holding a Quran also entered a church also faced Mecca and began to pray. Oddly enough, some people found this menacing, probably because of the long knife. And uh, he was removed by police in an act of Islamophobia. But you notice that there's a certain commonality to these. We had one Muslim holding a Quran, injuring people with a wrench and screaming Allahu Akbar. Another Muslim holding a Quran and a knife going into a church starting to pray. Another Muslim going into a church screaming Allahu Akbar and putting the Nazi symbol on the wall. Uh, also in France recently, David, there was a documentary that uh, aired on a television program, a popular television program called Forbidden Zone. And uh, it was about a town in France called Roubaix and about how it has a very large Muslim population and it is increasingly Sharia adherent. Uh, for example, we were talking about dolls earlier, the fellow in Colorado who wanted to burn his sister's idols and so on. And in, in Roubaix, you can buy dolls that are Islamic. They have no face. Mm -hmm. And so they're not idols. And uh, this was presented as part of the Islamization of the town. In any case, there was a Muslim lawyer who was against all this, who was interviewed, and another journalist. And uh, they have both been threatened with death and are now in hiding because they spoke about this. Uh, yet another story in France in, in a different place. A different Muslim holding a different knife and a different Quran threatened passersby. So that's three Muslims carrying knives and Quran. So actually, one of them had a wrench in a Quran. Yeah, you, you, yeah. So there's no connection. <laughs> <laughs> These guys got knives. This guy's got a wrench. You're destroying your own argument here, Robert. That's it, man. You got me busted. Okay. There's no verse in the Quran which says strike them with wrenches that's right therefore it's a religion of peace misunderstanding they're everywhere in pakistan a lot of stories out of pakistan we got uh, uh pastor william siraj and reverend patrick naeem two christian clerics were mm. driving home from church in the city of peshawar in pakistan and a group of muslims opened fire on the car killed mm. pastor siraj and injured Reverend Naeem. <clears throat> this is also in Pakistan. A woman was sentenced to be hanged by her neck till she is dead for images of Muhammad that she allegedly posted on WhatsApp. So something that I do like seven times a month, posting pictures of Muhammad, I, I use them in thumbnails. Uh, and I use them in thumbnails to sort of because I use the I use the Charlie Hebdo I use the Charlie Hebdo images which in sort of protest for all those people being slaughtered in the name of Allah. But uh, things that we do pretty regularly here get you killed over there. And uh, yeah, it's most most of the and I mean think about this I, I'm involved with Islam pretty regularly. Most 
of the stories you share whenever we get together for uh, for a live stream. Most I've never heard of, right? I've never heard of. So we still know that these are not reaching. These are not reaching the vast majority of people. If even people who deal with Islam on a, on a regular basis still aren't aware of them, because I think the only ones you've mentioned that I'm familiar with were, were the attack in Texas. I mean, the, the hostage situation in Texas. And then uh, the the two pastors who were attacked by a guy, you know, guys on a, on a motorcycle. And so it's a, this is a, by the way, this is, this is another plug for uh, Robert's book. That's what, that's the, the biggest thing that I noticed when I read your book was just how completely relentless it is and how little of that relentlessness we know about. Because I've been debating whether Islam is a religion of peace and talking about jihad for a long time. I didn't know probably 90% of what was what's in your book. And then here you are today. And every time we get together, I'm not familiar with 90 to 95% of, of the attacks that are going on in the world. And it's just, my goodness, if, if, if people start to catch on just based on the little bit of information that actually gets to them. Imagine, imagine if people, if their eyes were open and people just saw, hey, all around the entire world right now, you've got jihadis trying to subjugate the world in the name of Allah, and they do not, they just, they don't stop. And this is why I think there's such a campaign of obfuscation, misinformation, disinformation, to prevent people from knowing about these things. I got plenty more, David. I know that time is short, but we can get to some of them. Uh, violent attacks. There was a 91-year-old Christian in Bangladesh, Malcolm da Costa, in Padrishipur, a village in Bangladesh, 91 years old. And uh, it was a deliberate attack on a Christian family. People came into his house and killed him, menaced the family. The uh, people, of course, have not been punished because all too often in such cases in majority Muslim countries, the authorities sympathize with the uh, attackers. And if they, I mean, it's really Sorry. hard It's really hard to go against the attackers. Even if you didn't sympathize with them, you start going after these attackers. Well, guess what? They have, they have their fellow attackers, right, that you haven't caught, and then you become a target. And, I mean, how many times have we seen you know, lawyers being killed because they decided that they were going to defend uh, someone who's under a sentence for, for blasphemy and things like, things like that? Mm -hmm. A story you may have heard of, David, because it got quite a lot of play. Uh, uh, a man in Iran beheaded his 17-year-old wife and then walked around with the head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and was uh, captured on video walking around with it. Um, I mentioned this. I want to make it very clear why I'm mentioning this one. Uh, when I posted that at Jihad Watch, I got a lot of flack. And I have gotten flack in the past, even from people who say that they're ex-Muslims. Because they say, does Islam allow killing the wife? Well, no. Well, then what are you saying this has to do with Islam for? This is why. Because... Islam is unique among the religions of the world in sanctioning the beating of the wife, as we were discussing before. No other religion, there's spousal abuse in every context among every people in the world, but no religion allows it except Islam. Once you allow that, you are sanctifying an act of violence, <clears throat> and that can very easily get out of hand and inculcate in the person who believes he has the right before Allah to do this. The idea that he can go farther and farther, because after all, this is something that he has been allowed to do. He's been actually commanded to do. And so I believe that the beheading of the wife in Iran, in this very famous story from this past week, it's a manifestation of a culture of violence that is created by chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran and the passages of the Hadith that sanction and, 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 and strengthen the allowance for wife beating. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add that, so, so just to be clear, everyone, you do have honor killings as a cultural practice that has that was there before Islam. Um, and so you have modern, modern defenders of Islam who want to say, well, therefore, it has nothing to do with Islam when someone does it today. 
Um, but what you have in the Muslim sources, as Robert just pointed out, you have violence that is allowed against your wives if they get out of line. Notice that the, the violence against your wife is just, even if you just fear, I mean, the, the Quran says, if you fear rebellion, right? If you just say, hey, I think she might be rebelling against me. She hasn't done anything, but you know, I'm a little paranoid here. And so I'm going to just go, you know, do a preemptive beating against her. Um, that can be over nothing, right? That can be over nothing. And Muhammad said, a man, he said, you shall not question a man as to why he, he beat his wife. If she's gone more out of line, if she's gone more out of line, it is very easy to justify what, what we call honor killings, what would historically be an honor killing with the Muslim sources. And, and here's how it goes, right? There's a death penalty for apostasy in Islam. If you leave Islam, if you leave Islam, that is a death sentence, according to Islam. And three of the four uh, traditional Sunni schools say that you you execute a woman just as you would execute uh, uh, just as you would execute a man, and so death penalty for not uh, continuing to follow Islam for leaving Islam. But but notice what you have here in the Quran. This is Surah four, verse sixty five of the Quran. Allah says, "But no, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you." O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. And notice what that just said. You have no real Islamic faith if you have any disagreement uh, about anything Muhammad with anything Muhammad says, if or if you haven't completely submitted to everything Muhammad says. And so you're not a real Muslim if you are not following Islam really, really well. And what does that allow? My wife is, you know, she's she's dressing in the wrong way. She's following uh, American rules. She's not submitting to me properly. Does she really believe in this? Is she really a Muslim according to Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran? Uh, no. Well, what's that mean? Busty. Huh? Yeah, so she's an apostate. Wait, you kill apostates. Uh, gets even uh, gets even stronger because Muhammad also said, carry out Allah's penalties even against your own family members. So wait a minute, the penalty for my wife, because she's, she does, she's not really a, a Muslim, according to Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, the penalty against her is death. I'm supposed to carry out penalties even against my own family members. And guys, keep in mind, we're not the only ones who start, who start thinking like this. Abu Bakr, after... Um, after Muhammad died and Abu Bakr had to fight the apostate war, some of those apostates weren't just like saying, hey, we're no longer Muslims. They were just people who say, hey, we don't believe in, in paying our zakat to, to Abu Bakr, right? We'll, we'll, pay, we'll, we'll do our zakat on our own. We'll, we'll, we'll give alms on our own. We don't have to do it to you. And Abu Bakr said, if, if you don't give me even a, a, a piece of rope that you would have given Muhammad, I'm coming to kill you. And so notice what he's saying. He's saying, it's, you're not renouncing Islam. You're not renouncing the five pillars. You're just not doing things in exactly the way he says you have to do them. That's enough for you to be killed as an apostate. And then you've got, and then you've got fathers, brothers, um, husbands, killing women, killing wives, killing daughters, killing sisters, killing them for, for getting out of line with Islam. And you just say, there's no, we don't see the connection here. Come on. There's also a uh, hitter, you know? Yeah, in the Quran. Chapter 18, mm. verse 80. Uh, this strange figure, not named in the Quran, but called hitter in Islamic tradition. He's walking around with Moses, and he kills this boy. And Moses asks him why. And he says, and as for the boy, his parents were believers. And we were afraid that he would oppress them by rebellion and disbelief. So he kills the disbelieving boy. Uh, that, of course, is in the Quran. It's behavior that can be emulated. Okay, Germany. A few from Germany, uh, very much like in France. In Germany, a Muslim entered a church during a service, threw himself on the ground, and began screaming about Allah. In Germany, I, I can't hold that against him. I scream about Allah a lot too. <laughs> he was probably a fan of Acts 17 apologetics. Germany also, a Muslim migrant was erected, uh, arrested with a gun at a train station. He said he wanted to kill as many people as possible, hmm. but he was not able to do so. He was unfortunately apprehended before that. Okay, going on to Africa, we have in the Congo, 
Muslims murder at least 12 people, torch six houses, burn four motorbikes. Now, the motorbikes is really too much. Yeah, you got you to gotta wage jihad on those motorbikes. <laughs> Nigeria, Muslims murder 11 Christians, burn an elderly grandmother to death. Also in Nigeria, a separate incident. Muslims murder four people, abduct 24, burn down four churches, 33 shops, and 73 houses. In another incident, jihadis murder 22, pe 22 Christians, burn down 24 houses. In another incident, also in Nigeria, screaming lock lock bar, 18 Christians murdered. In another incident, also in Nigeria, this was actually a man on Twitter, a Nigerian, explaining that he was actually kidnapped by jihadis while he was riding down a road in Jos in Nigeria. And he said that they asked, are you Muslim or Christian? And when he said he was Christian, they intensified the beating. And this, of course, is because of the imperative to wage war against unbelievers. And, and by the way, uh, uh, <clears throat> the reason you have so many attacks in Nigeria is uh, that is, ladies and gentlemen, that's one of the dividing lines where you have massive Muslim majority on one side of a dividing line in, in Nigeria and massive Christian majority on, on the other side of the line in Nigeria. It's one of the dividing lines. And so the jihadis are constantly trying to push that back, push that line forward, right? And so yep. that's one of the reasons you have so many attacks there. Whereas in other parts of the world, you have, you'll have you have large parts of the Muslim population who are, oh, no, Islam's peaceful and tolerant and so on. When you get to the areas where, hey, we're trying to expand the, uh, the realm of Islam, a lot more attacks. Also, Kenya, same thing, David. Uh, an attack on a bus. Jihadis murdered 13 people. They often stop the buses in this area of Kenya and uh, do the same thing that they did in this Nigeria story we were just talking about. Uh, ask the people on the bus, are you Muslim or Christian? Or they ask the people to recite the Shahada or something else mm -hmm. Islamic. And if they won't do it or can't do it, then they're killed. I, I remember that. I think it was in the uh, in that... Uh in that mall massacre from years yeah. ago, that was in Kenya, wasn't it? But I think the I think yeah. the jihadis were going up to people in the mall saying, "Are you are you Muslim?" And if you said yes, they would ask you to recite something. Uh, show us. Yeah. You you have to prove that you uh you know the prayers and so on. And if you couldn't, then you're dead. Uh, also in Kenya, actually outside Kenya, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a Kenyan Kenya's most wanted terrorist, Rashid Mohammed Salim was captured at the end of January. And uh, he they got him talking. He explained that he killed a soldier, a Kenyan soldier, uh, in the name of Allah, as part of efforts to make ensure that Islam can rule the whole world. I wonder where he got that idea. Hmm. Yeah, no idea. Also in Kenya, a uh, man converted to Islam went to the home of some Christians friends of his, and blew himself up, hmm. killing the parents and severely injuring their teenage daughter. Also in Kenya, a group of jihadis approached a vehicle convoy and opened fire, injuring six people. Uh, then we go to Thailand, where jihadis placed bombs in front of convenience stores, shops, a market, an animal hospital, and a car care shop. Meanwhile, in Belgium, an imam has been found to be preaching jihad in the Grand Mosque, the Al Khalil Grand Mosque in Molenbeek. But he cannot, he was uh, supposed to be deported, but actually his residence permit was withdrawn. And then another imam from Belgium, he was supposed to be deported, but then he was, the deportation was canceled on human rights grounds. But I got to wonder about the human rights of the people who might be killed in jihad attacks that he is responsible for there in Belgium. That doesn't seem to be on the radar. I got more, David, but I see it's nine o'clock. Yeah, it's just uh, doesn't seem like an hour is long enough to just briefly, briefly mention the attacks that are occurring around the world. So very strange situation. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
I've mentioned Robert's book. If you want the history of jihad, in other words, if you want to go from the time, of, if you want to learn about the time of Muhammad down to the present, um, get that book. If you want to learn what's going on in the world today on a daily basis, uh, go to Robert's site, jihadwatch.org, and the links to both of those are in the description box. All right. Any uh, final words for everyone, Robert? Uh, this never ends, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, we joke about how there's not going to be any jihad next week, but the jihad imperative is going to continue as long as there are people who believe that Muhammad is the prophet of Allah who commanded him to fight against people until they confess that there's no God but Allah and he is the messenger. And so there will always be jihad. And what we need to do uh, collectively around the world, the non-Muslims, is formulate a coherent and intelligent response to it. But instead, most of the world's authorities are in total denial about this. Mm -hmm. So everyone uh, become informed, uh, <clears throat> inform others. So be able to tell other people. So stay up to date with Robert's site and be able to inform people, share these stories uh, on Twitter and Facebook and so on as they come out so that other people know about them. Um, learn about the connections to the teachings of Muhammad so that you can point out where people are getting these ideas. And then when the question inevitably arises, but what do we do about it? Well, don't go attacking. Don't go attacking Muslims. Don't go pulling off hijabs. Expose Muhammad in the Quran. Learn how to expose Muhammad in, in, and the Quran. That is how you solve the problem of jihad. All right. We can say we wouldn't be back next week, Robert, but we know that's a lie, as you've pointed out. See everyone next week when we'll talk about everything that happens between now and then. And sadly, there will be a lot. Indeed. Thank you, David.